a lot of people uh, have, again, it, it, there's just been this bombardment of tweets and emails. Uh, well, first, they're conflating two things at some point. So I just want to say again, really quickly up front, I have no problem with atheists or atheism at all. I don't personally identify as such, um, but I, I, I sort of have a profound uh, disinterest in uh, criticizing. I, I, I have no universal criticism of atheists at all, and uh, a lot of my best friends are atheists. But no, but like all, all kidding aside, I, it's, just, it's just not the issue. Um, I, I think some people, you know, they take atheism in a different way. It's more kind of fundamental to how they look at the world and what they think need, they, is needed to solve the world's problems. I don't uh, share that view in the same way, but that's something that we can debate, we can talk about. I, I don't object to that at all in the same way that I object to some of this very specific work of Sam Harris uh, and to a lesser and to another degree Richard Dawkins although frankly I take Harris more uh, seriously in some respects because Dawkins uh, Dawkins really you know Harris is attempting to make an argument about some of these things a profoundly problematic simplistic and wrong one but he's really trying to make an argument Dawkins has not um so I just want to kind of clear up, I'm not objecting to atheism. That is not the issue. I'm objecting to a very specific brand of it. Now, let's get to, to Harris. First of all, I, I want to make this brief point and be very specific, and then we'll get into the actual, you know, Harris likes to talk a lot, he calls the, the terrestrial, the real world implications of things. So that's mainly what I want to focus on when I talk about Sam Harris. That's what I'm interested in. I will say up front, again, from an academic point of view, whether from the perspective of studying comparative religion, philosophy of religion, religion as a historical social phenomenon, uh, or religion in, pol in politics or economics, his model of religion, which is basically just a literalist text reading, is a really unsophisticated one. It's not to deny that there aren't some people who take uh, literalist uh, interpretations of holy texts uh, somewhat at face value, although I think you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who takes it as quite as literally as Harris seems to think many people do, uh, and, and that you know, fundamentalist re and extremist religion uh, is a problem. I would suggest almost always it is a a symptom resulting from other things, very, 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 very rarely a core defining driver or explainer. So if you're trying to figure out what's happening in uh, uh, the Middle East and your main metric is the Quran and the Hadith, you are going to have a profoundly limited, delusional, and wrongheaded perspective, by definition, you are not uh, going to be taking in all of the variables you need to take in to actually have a fully integrated understanding of this. Now, you know, as an example, you want to talk about the Qatari government. Why does Qatar, uh, you know, uh, allow funding for groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda to move through Qatar, at the same time host a U.S. military base, uh, have relatively nice backdoor relations uh, uh, with Israel? Uh, and, and sort of pivot against Saudi Arabia, even though they're a, another uh, sort of Sunni uh, Gulf state. It's really simple. It's because G Qatar is a small island nation with an enormous amount of wealth that's playing a sort of uh, multi-pivoted game to keep themselves insulated and protected from their immediate neighbors, and they're trying to strike alliances and calculate geopolitically as best they can. They thought the Muslim Brotherhood would stay in Egypt. They didn't. They calculated uh, differently. Another great example of this on the opposite, ex uh, on the opposite end, uh, Saudi Arabia, which I agree. Again, if you're talking about actual issues and actual institutions and actual religious biases, this is a regime that has specifically funded a very, very narrow, highly fundamentalist brand of Islam, uh, of Sunni Islam, Wahhabism, which is a problem. That specifically is a problem. 
Uh, now, again, but from the perspective of international relations and, and regional strategy, uh, do the Saudis support the Muslim Brotherhood as part of their fellows in this you know, global Muslim conspiracy that people like Sam Harris seem to see? Uh, no, they don't. They actually supported a secularist military junta getting rid of the Muslim Brotherhood because their main interest is stability in the region, a junta, incidentally, that I'm sure Harris and fellows like that have a lot of sympathy for because, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is you know, is terrifying. Again, I know that Harris will say the Muslim Brotherhood, he recognizes they're different than ISIS, they're different than Al-Qaeda, blah, 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 concentric circles. But the reality is, is there's still sweeping broad claims about the nature of Islam and Muslim politics, which doesn't take into account these broader regional strategic uh, and, and geographic questions, which are really the core drivers. Now, that's the sort of first set of points. Now, let's get to specific examples. Sam Harris has supported torture. In the end of faith, he talked, and I'll quote directly, quote, given the damage that we are willing to cause the bodies and minds of innocent children in Afghanistan and Iraq, our disavowal, uh, avowal of, uh, dis disavowal of torture in the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed seems perverse. If there is even a chance in a one in a million that he would tell us something under torture that would lead to the further dismantling of Al-Qaeda, it would seem we should use every means at our disposal to get him talking. That's the end of faith, page 198. Now, look, so that's an advocacy of a torture. Now, uh, people have said he's never advocated that. That's a direct, uh, that's him saying it. Now, he's using a ticking time bomb, highly narrow scenario and contrasting it with actions in Afghanistan and Iraq, which he himself acknowledges causes massive civilian casualties, even though he was a strong supporter of the war in Afghanistan and at the very least highly ambiguous on Iraq. And we'll get to that soon. Now, there's nothing unique about that argument. That's the same basic logic that the torture program was run under which is that, yes, this group, uh, Dick Cheney, the 1% doctrine, we need to switch the burden of proof on torture from, uh, uh, you know, and, and national security generally, from focusing on things that are likely uh, and things that uh, uh, are, are apparent and causing responses to the 1% doctrine. If there is even a 1% chance or less that a catastrophic ex event could happen because of a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda, then we need to take the gloves off. Torture, secret wars, all of the rest of, of policy that we've implemented into the war on terror era. Now, again, you can agree or disagree with that. I happen to profoundly disagree with that on a number of levels, including uh, of which we've actually seen that traditional interrogation techniques favored by the FBI have worked better than torture. Uh, that's the practical real world reason for opposing it. We also have strong moral objections to torture. Sam Harris's argument, even though he's using a fun philosophical trick and he goes on to talk about the ticking time bomb, which is a pro profoundly rare, rare, rare incidents. That's not how policy is designed, okay? This isn't 24. We live in the real world. That's the same logic adopted by the CIA, Dick Cheney, and the Bush administration. He's not using some special secularist logic to advocate for this policy. It's the same thing. Now, agree or disagree, but don't say I'm misrepresenting his position. He's saying there are extraordinary conditions under which torture is justified. I'm saying empirically we see it doesn't work, empirically the program was systemic and massive and he does and then and then that's where he goes to well i'm a philosophy writer and i'm not writing about and i'm and he's very sneaky but there's a direct policy implication of that argument and that policy implication is an umbrella for a mass torture program which i object to morally legally and from a policy perspective you can answer that great if you can't accept that your guru supports torture and be done with it. If you have a defense of it, give me a defense of it. But I don't want to hear any more. You can't be fair to him. Okay, so that's number one. That's torture. Number two, he's advocated for profiling Muslims. Now, Sam Harris makes this point uh, in his response to the controversy post that, of course, he is personally opposed to racism from people of Pakistani, Somali, uh, and other descents of people with large Muslim populations. But then in the same argument that he made th that profiling can be justified, he said, look, we need to, as a matter of practical policy, be profiling people that fit a, you know, a jihadist profile, whatever the hell that means. We know what that means. Exactly. As Matt said, we know what that means. So again, what are the practical ramifications of that 
in terms of the real world implications of profiling. Those same people that he objects, he says he has no racial problem with, are going to bear the burden of a policy that monitors them and profiles them at airports. Again, that's the reality. That's the real world consequence. So even as he's squirrely about it, and that's another column that he said, oh, I shouldn't have written it. It wasn't worth all the grief I've taken and liberals are taking me out of context, blah, 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 blah. Again, as a guy who's always ranting about the real world consequences of beliefs, which he takes to a, on a profoundly literalist and simplistic level, the real world consequences of his thought experiments are the systemic harassment of certain populations, which we've already seen in things like the NYPD surveillance of Muslim communities across New York City. These are the real-world consequences of what he's advocating. This is another important point, because when we're talking about Muslim populations, again, I apologize to do this to you, but we have to make, again, geographic distinctions here, okay? Those same Pew polls that he's always going on about that might show certain attitudes in certain Middle Eastern countries show very different attitudes in South Asian countries, show profoundly different attitudes amongst Muslims in Eastern Europe. Now, again, bringing it close to home, let's make another distinction. In Europe, there are distinctions in Muslim communities immigrating uh, to Europe. And again, Muslim communities have been victims of very far right-wing politics in Europe, which Harris, again, even as he said, he does not support fascist parties in Europe, but they're the only ones that have been willing to speak about mo with moral clarity about the Muslim threat. So just index that as well. It's another thing he'll squirrel out of, but he did write that. Muslim communities in Europe uh, are in many cases, again, people who are attempting to build new economic lives for themselves, new social lives. They are Their attitudes track uh, with many social norms in Europe. But there are certain communities and areas of difficulty in terms of accepting some of the norms of these countries. Again, multiculturalism goes both ways. There's a racial dynamic to the anti rise of anti-immigrant parties. And there are legitimate questions in certain Muslim communities about responding to uh, and, and fitting with some of the norms uh, in European societies. It's a very complex issue, nothing that's going to be uh, answered, again, by a one-size-fits-all, silly and bigoted view of Islam, and also something that's not going to be answered by denying that in certain cases there aren't some problems. In America, the Muslim population in America is profoundly integrated with a broader American mosaic. There's tremendously, there's low levels of extremism. Their uh, social attitudes track with other American populations. American Muslims, from a practical policy perspective, are another part of this country trying to survive in today's economy, in today's world. Every poll bears that out. So again, where there is the most immediate policy and social consequence of this kind of stupid, of this kind of broad, simplified, fear-mongering uh, belief about Islam, the broadest consequence of that is empowering, in an American context, Sharia conspiracy theorists, harassment of Muslim kids at high schools, um, and, and, a, and, a, and a politics of fear completely non board out by any facts in the American context. The European context, slightly more complicated, but again, no answers. In the Middle Eastern context, again, you want to go through the hard process of rooting out uh, these policies, simply running around and shouting that people's holy book is terrible and their founder of their faith was a child molester is not likely uh, to root out ISIS, let alone explain ISIS. But that's a conversation for another day. Now I'll give you to the final point. You have to talk about Israel. Sam Harris, through basically quoting the Hamas charter, has turned the conversation into Israel into the same simplistic, delusional conversation he's turned everything else in, which is that Israel, even though, again, in the real terrestrial empirical world, is a regional power, no one else in the region could possibly approach Israel militarily. A, par, a country that has presided over a 40-year occupation, a siege on Gaza, and a country with a massive domestic appetite for right-wing expansionist politics. Again, not rooted. I mean, look, the Shas party, yes, there's ultra-Orthodox parties in, in, Jew, in uh, Israel. 
there's somewhat of a problem. But there's also a lot of actually religiously active Jews who are quite concerned about human rights. The core driver of these policies in Israel is right-wing nationalism, which is a far more dangerous problem in that conflict and in domestic Israeli politics than anything else. I don't see Sam Harris worrying about right-wing nationalism. But again, he quotes the Hamas charter. And the Hamas charter says absolutely horrible things about Jewish people, and it's terrible. And Hamas has engaged in acts. I'll make that distinction. I won't call Hamas a terrorist organization, but they have engaged in acts. Certainly, I consider suicide bombings and rockets that target innocent civilians acts of terrorism. I also consider dropping white phosphorus on civilian populations, bulldozing people's homes, collective punishment, detaining children, a wanton disregard for civilian casualties, I consider those profound human rights violations, all of which Israel has regularly engaged in. But once you take the debate to this simplistic formula and level of abstraction where Hamas, which is absolutely a group that you can condemn, but like the IRA, you can do business with and must do business with, and indeed have done business with, there have been backdoor negotiations between Israel and Hamas, between the United States and Hamas, Europeans directly with Hamas. Their objection is rooted in a political and geographic fact of dispossession and occupation. Those are real-world conditions. You think tomorrow that if the Palestinians all of a sudden said, hey, we want marriage equality and feminism, that all of a sudden they would say, oh, yeah, and while you're at it, you know what? Keep control of our land and don't let us have freedom of movement. And the response he would say is that if Palestinians did that, Israel would happily give them a state. That's a completely fatuous and disingenuous argument that completely misunderstands the power dynamics of the situation and the political logic that leads to occupation. You think that people who advocate for greater Israel don't see the their own reasons for, first of all, satisfying the demands of vital new voter blocks who get free land, subsidized uh, housing and all sorts of other massive benefits from living in occupied areas. You don't think that there's a massive political appetite and political constituency around all of the economics that keep the occupation going and keep the siege going. This is the problem when you don't look at real issues and real conditions on the ground. And incidentally, you can have the same stupid perspective and say, well, you know, if you read the Torah, the Torah says Jewish people are chosen people. So therefore, Israel does this. So therefore, I understand everything about Israel. Great. That's really going to get you somewhere. It's not. That's another vital example of why the simplistic text reading is robbing you of a uh, the solutions and the critiques and the stands that everybody needs to take to solve one of the most intractable and dangerous situations in the world today while dehumanizing a group of people that is already literally robbed of their rights and identity on a daily basis. Final point, uh, you're right. Sam Harris, I don't know. Sam Harris said uh, with regards to Iraq, and this is again quoting him, uh, you know, that he said, I have... I have never known what to think about the war. That's fine, okay? In the end of faith, the main part of the section dealing with Iraq was to defend the morals of George W. Bush from Noam Chomsky and to do a long, abstracted case about uh, the moral validity of invading Iraq and removing Saddam Hussein. I have no doubt that if the invasion had gone successfully, Harris would say he supported it. It hasn't gone successfully, so now he thinks more ambiguously about it. And, of course, the biggest problem in the invasion, in addition to bad planning, which everybody acknowledges, but it was not debathification. It wasn't privatizing the whole country. It wasn't destroying any remnants of the attempts to form independent labor unions, the secular left, and other things that Harris would supposedly care about in an Iraqi context. No, it was that bad planning, and of course, the Bush administration underestimated the sectarian tensions between Muslims and Iraq, because obviously those things explain everything because Muslims are you know, bloodthirsty and irrational. Now, again, we've explained countless times on the show, and if you talk to someone like Vijay Prashad, who actually understands the region, who actually has studied the region, who actually has lived there, who actually knows politics, who actually knows geography, who actually knows resource conflicts, 
they will explain to you that the sectarian divisions are, first of all, connected with myriad other divisions, tribal divisions, district divisions, and really connected essentially to patronage systems. It wasn't just like, oh, under Saddam, the Sunnis are treated great because they're Sunni. They're connected to patronage networks that get jobs, that get delivery of services. The flip side with debathification, the Shia clique has done the same thing to the Sunnis in post-Saddam Iraq. I'm not saying, again, that sectarian conflicts and people's religious convictions are completely disconnected from this. But it, is, again, is not the core driver. So look, I fully expect that people who are committed disciples and Sam Harris is their guru are going to write in and I am and, and I, did, I misrepresented this and da, da 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 And look, I'm not writing a book on Sam Harris. And Sam Harris is very clever and he adds a lot of caveats. Um, and it is, again, ironic, as many people have noted, that for a guy who's constantly saying we should be just basing our understanding of the world on literalist text reading of holy texts, uh, and that should be our main takeaway, particularly in some of the most politically volatile and economically complex places in the world. It is interesting that for a guy who says that, he claims to be taken out of context a whole hell of a lot by a whole hell of a lot of people. But if you have any open-mindedness, you want to check down those quotes, and you want to actually study context, uh, I would advise you to do so. Uh, and that's the final word on Sam Harris for a little while.